Today, we're going to talk about how in an unequal world, we can find a fair solution to climate change. Hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom rivet Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we talk about the issue of fairness in climate change. How do we determine whose responsibility it is to take action to solve this issue? And how can we come together to make progress in a way that feels fair for everyone? Plus, we talk to Angel Gurria, Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Thanks for being here. So today, we're going to talk about what's fair. We know when it comes to climate change that we need to reduce our emissions by half in the next 10 years, and we need to get them to zero 20 years after that. Science is extremely clear about that for us to have a chance at keeping to 1.5 degrees and not experiencing all the very, very many negative impacts that come with getting even to two degrees. But the question for humanity is, How do we collectively deal with that? And of course, the Paris Agreement was part of it. But should those countries with more money and resources do more? Um, Would it be fair for the emerging economies that now have many more emissions from things like coal to actually step up and do more? That's the issue. And it's a huge issue that we're going to try and get our arms around today. Well, you know, Tom, you said we have to reduce our emissions. We have to start by defining who's our Who are we talking about? Humanity. Humanity. Yeah, humanity. The emissions that come from the human presence on this planet. Okay, wonderful. But. Defined. We're all equal, but some of us are much more equal than others. (laughs) Voila the problem, right? Right, exactly. That's the problem. So historically, just to make things as simple as possible, historically, the industrialized countries have put out most of the emissions in the past and hence could be deemed to be more responsible. However, it is the developing countries, particularly the large emerging countries, that are going to be putting out, according to business as usual, most of the emissions into the future. So here we have, first of all, a past and future into two groups of countries. Now, even in those two large groups of countries, again, some are much more equal than others. So how would you divide up that pie? inside them. Well, I mean, this was one of the reasons why I realized that I would be a terrible UN diplomat was whenever at the UN countries started talking about this and explaining their point of view, I would believe everybody because everybody had a good logical basis but for what they were saying. Right. But yeah, they're all right. Everybody is often right. Yep. Yeah. So how do we deal with that, Paul? Well, we muddle through, which is what we've always done. And, you know, even within countries, you've got people with private jets and then you've got people who travel on the bus or, or take the bicycle. Uh, but what we do is we, we, we solve problems by thinking hard about how to solve them, getting new technologies, getting mass movements going and ultimately using truth, justice and science to deliver a perfect future for all mankind and womankind and, and, and all uh, every other non so, well, Amen. <laughs> so Paul's, the solution we have is just use truth, justice and science. So that's a, that's a plan, I suppose. It's actually a brilliant plan and much underestimated. And leading organisations like the OECD um, strongly promote this kind of uh, integrated thinking and problem solving amongst and within nations. Right. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a nice segue there. So let's cut the problem down ever so slightly. Let's talk about it in two pieces. First of all, I think there is fairness between countries, between one country and another. And the other thing is fairness within countries. So let's start with fairness between countries. Christiana, can you give us a 30 second overview of the issues around fairness between countries? Between individual countries? Right. Well, actually, Tom, I have come to the conclusion that fairness is not the question. So now you're going to say I shouldn't become, (laughs) I shouldn't be part of this conversation because we are never going to solve the fairness issue Hmm. because looking at the fairness is actually looking at this from the point of view of the burden, the responsibility and the scarcity of what we have here. And no one is ever going to say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll draw the short stick. I'll take the small yeah. piece of the pie. So 
I think the only way to get out of this is, first of all, certainly to support developing countries in the trans, uh, transition that they have to undertake. Support them with money? Support, support them with money, with technology, with political support, with capacity training, with everything. Okay. This is about understanding why those who decarbonize are actually strengthening their economy as opposed to debilitating their economy. So let me put it this way. I just went running and I was thinking, if I were competing for my health hmm. with someone else who's running, well, first of all, everybody else would win because I don't run that much. But the point is, am I competing against someone because I have to, or am I actually doing this for my health? Hmm. And I think that is the the turn, you know, the mental shift that we have to do. Countries are decarbonizing not because they have a huge responsibility and they are trying to get out of a global responsibility. They're doing it because they understand it's better for their economic health. It's also better for the planetary health. But in as much as we understand that, we're actually going to get much more progress. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. I think that the, the, the nice thing about cutting it that way, and, you know, this did in part come back to what was in the Paris Agreement around seeing this as an opportunity to be grasped rather than a burden to be shared, is it enables you to just flip the thinking on it rather than try and win the game of what size pie, slice of pie do you get. But, you know, we also have to get a sense of are we on track and are we doing enough? And if we're not, some people are going to have to step up and do more. Yes, but when I'm running, seriously, then I know how long I'm going to run and I have milestones on that road and I can check, you know, on my time, am I running in this, in the, uh, at the pace that I'm supposed to, am I covering the distance that I'm supposed to? So it's not that, you know, all of a sudden I'm going to say, right, you know, all of this is kumbaya, how wonderful, we're all going to get healthier, we're all going to have stronger economies and not measure. We have to yeah. constantly measure and we have to constantly measure against the milestones that have been set by science. And if we are on track, fantastic. And if we're not, we have to figure out how are we going to accelerate. But we accelerate out of a point of strength hmm. and out of a point of collective desire to become healthier economies. It's very difficult to strengthen out of, out of a point of regulation or punitive measures. Hmm. Uh, and people want a certain amount of kind of utility. That's the point. And we have to recognize that... Pretty much without exception, no one has suggested there is any utility really coming from greenhouse gas emissions. The, 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 it's a pollutant, right? When we were getting cigarettes out of society, we didn't think, oh, how are we going to ration the amount of cigarettes we can smoke between yeah. the different nations, you know, and, and, and give everyone an allocation and, you know, the richer countries could carry on smoking longer. No, no, we, we recognize we've got a problem here with a pollutant that was actually killing people and we just got rid of it. And, and what, the way we did it was we put bigger and bigger taxes on tobacco. And there are some beautiful graphs they're all over the internet. Just look at the tobacco prices rising and consumption falling. And that's what we're going to do with greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that that's, gets you straight out of this kind of like dividing the pie thing, which is rubbish. Yeah. So, so shortly we're going to go and talk to Angel Guerrilla, who is the Secretary General of the OECD, who has thought an enormous amount what about... What is the OECD? I think we should get Paul Dickinson to tell us. Okay, so the OECD is, and this is kind of inappropriate thing to say, but it's a kind of business class United Nations. <laughs> and I mean, with all the attendant problems and, and ethical difficulties, uh, but... Uh, I mean, I have flown business class once at least in my life and it's more comfortable and it's, I don't know, what am I driving at? The OECD is actually far more progressive and positive than you might expect. It's rich democratic countries who share ideas. I'm going to give you one thing that they've done that just blows my mind. In 1976, can you believe it? They set up guidelines for multinational enterprises that they've updated since and they are the only kind of uh, principles and standards for responsible bin business context in, in uh, globally. Um, they're, they're agreed. And, and I love the way the OECD steps up to global responsibility in a very focused way. So I think it's a fantastic institution. 
But but sorry, just for the facts, Paul. So it is a multilateral organization of which all of the industrialized countries are members. In fact, some developing countries are members because Mexico, for example, is both OECD and developing. But it's basically the larger economies. Um, and they're all members. They're headquartered in Paris. Um, and um, the organization is led by Angel Gurria. So it's like a UN for rich countries. It's a UN for richer countries. For yes. richer countries. Yeah. Um, so just before we go and talk to him, let's just touch on the other point we were going to talk about here. Sorry, he yeah. would probably also want us to clarify that there are some developing countries that are actually in observer state. Uh huh. And his status as Secretary General is kind of like, kind of like UNSG, goes to yes. all the head of state meetings, the Absolutely. G20, the G7. That's his sort of status on the yes, international he stage. Is on the, from a protocol perspective, he is considered a head of state. Uh huh. Okay. So just before we go and talk to him, um, let's just quickly touch on that other point about fairness within countries, because I know that this is something also that he has been really focused on. And I mean, last year, I went to West Virginia, to coal country, to McDowell County, which is the county that voted most overwhelmingly for Trump. And it is completely dependent on coal mining. Um, and the coal mining, the coal mines are closing down. Under Obama, they were. I don't know what's happened now under Trump. And it's led to this incredibly widespread unemployment throughout the county. Opioid epidemic is rife. Six in 10 children are being raised by someone other than their parents as a result of all of this. And it is an image of, of collapse in our midst. And it's sort of heartbreaking. And I found it kind of disquieting because on one level, I've worked most of my life to kind of make things worse there because... I believe that coal is creating enormous damage in the world. Um, but I also see that that's had a major impact on those specific individuals. And we can say there's going to be more jobs in solar panels, more jobs in wind, but that doesn't make any difference to those particular people. So let's just talk briefly before we go and see Angel Garia about how we can be fair to people inside countries. Well, but you've taken this to a different level. It's not just inside countries. You've actually taken this to the fairness of people who depend on the industry that needs to exit the economy. But how can you be fair to those people who, through no fault of their own, are dependent upon industries it's that not have very, to move on? It's not very difficult, Tom. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how you do it. You do something that actually used to happen, okay, uh, and then stopped happening. Uh, and it was called um, government intervention. I mean, uh, I, I'm, you know, I, and it's not, not got such a great reputation these days because certain schools of thought have said that the government can't get involved in anything at all. But... Um, you know, th th throughout history, uh, whole industries have disappeared and been replaced by technology and societies haven't ground to a halt and we haven't had this this kind of um, disaster like the one you described before. It's, it's uh, when the government doesn't feel for some reason or other ideologically or whatever that it's capable of kind of protecting and doing its job which is looking after its citizens who are undergoing a, a transformation then at that point uh, you do get these problems but uh, but it, it is not beyond the wit of nations to to look after uh, groups of people who are suffering which is what happens when there's an earthquake or something well well yes and I think there are a couple of avenues to this. So, yes, the 50,000 people who depend on coal in the United States could definitely be uh, given early retirement uh, and and thanked for and the work. After, and yeah. looked after. And looked after. And given proper health insurance, which is really what they need, yeah. because by now they all have heart, uh, black lungs. Um, but, but it's not only government. It actually can be a combination of both public and private efforts. So I'm thinking right now of Spain, where um, Spain has actually decided that they're going to move beyond coal. And what they have done in closing or in deciding to close all the coal plants is uh, the coal mines mm. and the plants is that they have uh, put a transition plan in place that most of the companies, if not all, are actually embracing because you don't close a coal mine from Sunday to Monday. You actually, once you decide that you're going to close it, there are there's a three-year process yeah. that needs to be engaged in to properly close um, a mine. And so the people who have been engaged in mining are then engaged in closing the mine. The amazing thing about that, um, and that hasn't been covered very much in the news, is that precisely 
the coal areas in Spain that under this new regulation of closing coal, you thought would have not voted for the left-leaning party in power are actually the areas where that left-leaning party got most of its growth hmm. and political support in the recent elections. Why? Because the people living there understood that the government is really on their side. Right. You know, if, if no mother or grandmother of men who have been working in a coal mine want their children or their spouses to continue working in a coal mine, we would all want our and particularly men, because it's almost all men, to have a much better job that is not so um, so terrible for health and, and working conditions. And so these people have realized that the government is on their side, that yes, they're going to close coal, but they are doing it not just in a fair way, they're doing it in a very, very caring and progressive and really well thought uh, way. And they got most of their political support. Yeah. I think that's a really nice example, as you know, because of the outcome there, but also because it's a sort of, it's instructive in terms of how we can get democratic systems to actually allow these sorts of changes, right? The ch kind of transformation we're talking about will only happen with the consent of the majority of the people. And that requires both a plan for sort of decarbonization and creating this new economy, but also looking after those individuals. Otherwise, you get situations, Absolutely. arguably like we had in Australia a few weeks ago, where it was called the climate election, and the party that was projected to win, that was going to be more am ambitious on climate, lost. And much of that analysis that came out afterwards suggests that's because they didn't have a plan for those people who were going to be suffering individually from that change. Sorry, hasn't Australia been having climate elections for the past 12 years? Well, the most recent climate oh, election. The most recent, <laughs> it's okay. true, Christiana. It's true and it's a fact and, and it's a fact and it's true. So so that's that's Australia for you. But I mean, what it, what it teaches me is that, you know, we work in climate change. You know, people would say, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're working as in an environmental protection or something, but we can't divorce that from social protection that they are totally. united that we, we are we are trying to look after people and the planet and you can't ignore either. Totally. All right, guys, we better go and talk to Angel Gurria. This is the way I would pronounce his name. <laughs> Angel Gurria. I, Cristiano, the long years of disappointment in my Spanish will, <laughs> will not come to an end now. <laughs> So, Secretary General Gurria, thank you so much for joining us. We are honoured to have you on Outrage and Optimism. We really appreciate you making the time. And we were particularly interested in talking to you. I mean, you've been a leader on these issues for such a long time. But the recent lecture that you gave on climate change, you talked a great deal about how we can come together and get ourselves back on track on climate around the world at this difficult moment. And you highlighted three points. First of all, putting people at the centre of climate policy. Secondly, pursuing environmental justice both within and between countries. And finally, ensuring long-term prospects for future generations. So these are all really interesting points. We would really like to double down on the central point around environmental justice both within and between countries. So I'm going to hand over to Christiana to kick off and delighted to have you here and very honoured to speak to you. Thank you. Well, can I, can I also welcome you? And I believe I'm welcoming you to your very first podcast. Is that actually true? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much for taking the time. Secretary Gurria, here's my question to you. Do you not think that because developed countries definitely have very clear historical responsibility, as well as the financial, technological, institutional stability to be able to deal with climate change, and developing countries are coming up in their development. How do we square that circle? Because yes, we agree that everyone has a responsibility, but should developed countries not be making more space for developing countries as we move into a zero net emission world by 2050? I think the effort should really be on the basis of supporting the countries to actually do the reduction uh, that they committed to do, because uh, let me just remind uh, our audience today that even if everybody delivers 100% of their commitments in Paris, we will still be uh, above the two degrees 
maybe at three, three and a half degrees. Substantially, yeah, 3.7 so, by some accounts, 3.7 degrees. I would say that there is an issue here that has to do with the accelerator element or the accelerating element of finance. So I would go on, this, on the money side. I would say let's, let's try to level the playing field by providing the necessary resources and, and therefore making it, uh, making it easier. I would more work on the, uh, on the question of trying to help those countries that have to do a faster catch-up uh, have the necessary resources. Well, and it's interesting that you mentioned countries that are part of the OECD, um, industrialized countries, uh, because it does seem that not all of them, because let's say Costa Rica and Chile are exceptions to that rule, but most of the countries that have already undertaken a zero net uh, target by 2050 are um, industrialized countries, which, um, and so so you, it, it does bring up the question, why is that? Well, it's why because, as I said before, they have the technology, they have the finance, um, and is is there also there among them the um, understanding that they have actually reached a certain level of economic development and of population growth that is leveling off, and hence they are under a very different circumstance than developing countries that are increasing population and um, and have to increase their economic and energy demand. Here, Christiana, uh, uh, what I would say is, and I think, you know, you, you mentioned your own country, and I think that Costa Rica is a wonderful example, you know, because Costa Rica has always been extraordinarily uh, uh, climate aware, environmentally aware. And it's a very good example of a country that has already set for itself a very ambitious target of going, you know, carbon neutral. But the question is whether you have the level of what I would call political consensus in those countries. And I will be uh, very uh, concrete. Uh, uh, there are many countries where uh, coal is still a very important uh, source of economic activity. And therefore, the going out of coal, let's say, uh, may necessarily take longer because the alternatives are not uh, very obvious. So my, my question really is, whether it is not uh, a question of information awareness, but also about the costs that are embedded in not acting fast, because the impact on health and the impact on the soil and the impact on the water and the impact on the, the air is, is, is just as bad when you have a developing country as when you have a developed country, and all True. you have to do is is look at what's going on with India or going on in in bad days in you know in Delhi or in bad days in uh, China, and you can see hmm. uh, the costs of the of, of dealing with the health implications or bad days in London. Th that kind of climate, everyone, are, are, it's same just thing. huge. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Se Secretary General, can I ask you something slightly different, which also comes from the lecture you gave, um, which is about climate justice within countries. So you referenced this concept of a just transition for workers. Um, and it just it's an interesting area because it sort of makes you realise that we're going to have to find a way to get democratic systems to allow us to make these changes. And a just transition pathway is a way of doing that. Do you agree with that analysis that just transition pathways are a way to get democratic systems to actually accept more ambitious climate action? And are there places where you've seen that done really well? Well, we've, we've seen some pushback against uh, uh, climate action through the ballot box in, in some recent elections. Hmm. And I suppose the, the US and Australia are, are, are good examples, and they're, they're both quite recent. Uh, but we've also seen um, in, in other, uh, you're talking about the politics of this, you've seen this massive uh, uh, upsurge of uh, the green wave in, mm. in the recent European elections. And, and this demonstrates how social headwinds can actually push elections outcomes the other way. Yeah. There's, a, there's a also a growing tide of uh, grassroots climate change through 
movements like uh, the Fridays for Future, the, 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 the school strikes for climate, the, yeah. this extinction rebellion, you know, one of my points precisely uh, now that you advocate the politics of this in, in um, the Geneva uh, lecture was precisely that there's going to be a price to pay hmm. on the political side. The price to pay is either today already for the greater awareness that there exists, but also because these youths that today are the ones who left school and who leave school, maybe some of them every, every week, to go and demonstrate in, in favor of uh, the environment, um, are going to be voting. And they are, and they are, they are fantastically contagious, huh? yeah. if I can say so. And I can tell you, I mean, the, the messages are so uh, overwhelming, so mature, so strong, so powerful, so difficult to to um, refute, to simply, <laughs> you know, to, to suggest anything against them. Right. Even even the the major oil companies are are taking notice. Uh, uh, the head of OPEC is, uh, you know, is 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 taking notice. This mass mobilization, the world opinion, you know, <laughs> today, the the wave of awareness is there. It's strong. It's very important. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I think uh, we should emphasize. Uh, it's the first one of my items. Uh, going back to putting people, yeah, at the center mm. of the whole equation here. Uh, it's, it's when you put people at the center, when the whole uh, question of the logic of justice uh, w within and uh, between countries and, and then the long-term issues uh, makes sense because it's, it, this should be people-driven first and foremost. Well, I, we totally agree. People-driven and... I think we also have to be very realistic that our world moves according to price. How are we going to finally be able to put a proper price, a proper valuation that really differentiates between the value of nature and human beings and the cost of climate change? We have seen so many different efforts, and they're all significantly ridiculous, frankly, in terms of their cost. Two, five, seven tons, uh, seven dollars a ton just doesn't cut it. When do you think we're going to have either the political space to put a proper price or the economic imperative to do so? I, I believe that is the single most important precondition to win the war. Uh, and the reason is that if we do not make the emissions expensive enough, we will not change the behavior. What do I mean? Well, I made it a point that, you know, I'm going to take the most scientific and the most accurate and the most uh, objective indicator. And I say, I recommend put a big fat price on carbon, okay? And this is my scientific recommendation. <laughs> Give me a number. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, the, the problem is very simple. We know 30 is the, let's say, imputed cost, okay, of an avoided ton of carbon CO2 equivalent. But what do you have in the ETSs of the world today? Two, five. Yeah, but you, you get seven and you get 13 and you get 17. And uh, so... I'd say uh, anything that gets you below $30, you're not even getting to the starting point. You're not even tickling the elephant. Well, yes, that's, that's exactly the point. But then you have cases like in, for some emissions in, in countries like Sweden uh, that go up to 100 euros. You subsidize. You subsidize the use of fossil fuels. So we are absolutely inconsistent. Uh, you know, we, we, we need to move in some kind of clear path towards the $100, you know, target, but by starting at 30, not by starting at 7 or 13 or 17. Now, putting a big fat price, starting with 30, maybe going to 100 over time, is something that we should all be 
doing because the idea is that in the in the process you will also find uh, uh, alternative sources of business of technology of uh, sales of jobs uh, rather than exclusively uh, a cost so again let's go back to the principle how do we actually uh, put people in the center of the climate action mm. um, by uh, putting, uh, among other things, a big fat price on carbon, which will change people's conduct and the conduct of the companies and uh, the conduct of the, uh, you know, the, of, of, of the authorities themselves when making their technological choices. Just let me tell you a very short story. I had a very big here at the OECD we house the um, the uh, uh, the export credit uh, group you know the export credit uh, agreement and all the countries that do export credits come here and align their own criteria etc we could not even eliminate all the coal fired uh, plants from the export credit facilities we only eliminated the more let's say the more obviously polluting ones, but they kept what they called the, the, the clean coal. There's no such thing, by the way, as clean coal, but they basically kept uh, some of them, even, and this is the OECD countries. These are the ones that you said, oh, yeah, but they're all the developing ones. They're, they're the ones who are moving faster. Well, there were some that were so interested that you could basically not eliminate uh, for export credit. That means they're not using them themselves. They're finished constructing, you know, or building new coal fire plants. Ah, but they're selling it to developing countries. And the developing countries are going with a mirage that the installation costs and the cost of the hardware in the short term is lower, and then they'll take the things, and then they get long-term financing, and uh, they, they, they buy the stuff. And then, of course, they have to pay the consequences in the next generations because there are going to be so many people who are going to be having uh, lung diseases and, and you know, diseases uh, born by bad air. This is the most serious intergenerational choice, the most serious intergenerational responsibility that we have. And it's not just theoretically to say, oh, there's a, we were the, the world we leave to our children and grandchildren. No, the pro problem is that we, it's, it's, it is real that we are abusing uh, the resources of the, of the planet and therefore putting ourselves in a situation where the benefits that we have received are not, no longer replicable for the future generations. And therefore, uh, you know, we, we have to very seriously consider how can we stop this, this process? Uh, we're not delivering on, on Paris. We are starting only the cycle, the five-year cycles, uh, where Fabius uh, and yourself, Christiana, were uh, you know, brilliantly defined this five-year setting system that made it possible to, to, uh, to have the agreements because everybody had a chance to kind of relook at the thing again. But the problem is, that uh, it's not happening. We, we need to create a, a new wave of awareness of the fact that this is not moving fast enough. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the young people are reminding us of that. Secretary Gurria, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, here's what I take. A big fat price on carbon pollution because um, that's what it costs to save millions of lives. Thank you very, very much. Really appreciate your taking time to join us on Outrage and Optimism. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> well, wonderful name, by the way, <laughs> because you need both. You need both. You need absolutely both. Almost for any cause, you need both. And what, huh? is, what is your personal balance between Outrage and Optimism? Oh, well, uh, you know... Uh, when, when uh, uh, they, they ask me whether I'm uh, optimistic or, or pessimistic, or I always say uh, I'd rather be activistic, uh, <laughs> simply Very good. because uh, so I never I, I would never get uh, uh, totally taken over by outrage, although uh, or, or, or there needs to be an element of outrage to trigger the what I would call the urgency, yes. yeah. the inevitability, even the sense of emergency. 
but not to the point where you know you 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 are paralyzed. And and then the question of optimism again, not to the point where you are denying, you know, being being in denial. In I, I don't, uh, as as Al Gore would say, I'm not referring to the river in um, in Egypt. In Egypt, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I think being in denial uh, uh, and and maybe thinking that everything is possible uh, sometimes has, uh, or that we can catch up very fast sometimes has made us lose ground right? because you really have to be running scared. You have to be running scared. Scared. Well, I am now changing your title. Activist Guria, thank you very, very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So that was an interesting conversation with uh, someone who really plays at the top table in terms of global politics and tries to get his arms around these issues and negotiates with Trump and with also everybody else, Bolsonaro, who is uh, who is um, either facing this issue and trying to do their best or trying not to. What do you guys leave that conversation with, Christiana? Well, I was um, I was taken by the fact that he so clearly sees that financial support to developing countries is where it's at. Yeah. Um, and in his recent climate change speech, he was very, very clear about that. Um, it's not surprising coming from an OECD perspective, mm. from an industrialized country perspective. It's not surprising that that's the way he sees it. But it is refreshing that he admits that that piece has to be there because sometimes developed countries, industrialized countries, countries have a hard time admitting that they really do have to um, be much more financially as well as technically supportive of developing countries. And that is not something that he is equivocating on at all. At all, right. I was absolutely delighted, delighted, delighted to hear him call clearly and unequivocally for a big fat price on carbon. Uh, yeah. Really high. Um, and that's what it's all about. Uh, the former chair of Shell recently in the Financial Times wrote a letter saying, we should have a $100 a ton tax on carbon and Extinction Rebellion should support that. Um, I think we're getting to the point now where we're talking about really high carbon prices, which we all know will change behavior and kind of solve this problem and give government tax revenues to help uh, poor people, poorer people, less economically advantaged people through the transition. But the one thing he didn't mention was why that hasn't happened, which continues to be that uh, lobbying, uh, often by private businesses or public companies, against yeah. big fat carbon taxes, which is where I think, once again, the OECD's guidelines for multinational enterprises, helping to get them, for example, out of the political process, are so important. So I was delighted by the interview. I thought it was great. Yeah. I also, I was really struck by, you know, because I've sort of, it's possible to look at the world at the moment and think that parties that are ambitious about climate change are going to take a, are taking a political toll and are suffering politically as a result of that. But I mean, he is a very astute, successful politician who really understands that world. And he was very clear that it is parties that don't get on top of climate change that either are in some places or are beginning to pay a higher political price. And I mean, that changes everything as well. And that makes possible things like a carbon tax, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the we together of the different elements that he talked about um, was very positive and very, very hopeful. Very. Um, and he is, uh, well, we, we, we were just interviewing him, but if you hear him speak in public, right, um, he is just an absolute enthusiastic ardent supporter of um, of climate action, yeah. both in the global north, um, also in the global south, but, but certainly uh, being very much of a thorn in the side for um, industrialized countries to do what they have to do. Get them to do what they need to do. Great. I mean, what is it he said? Uh, the, uh, if I quote the OECD website, finding evidence-based solutions and organizing for global standard setting. We, our movement has a great friend in the OECD. That's so exciting. Hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us this week on this episode of Outrage and Optimism. So thanks for listening to this episode of Outrage and Optimism. We're so pleased that so many of you are listening to the podcast and really appreciate you coming with us on this journey of so many perspectives. 
So I have an apology to make to those listeners that are paying attention. Last week, I promised you a conversation with John Ashford, the legendary DC lobbyist. And for reasons I won't bore you with, that's been delayed. But we hope to have that to you still sometime in the next few weeks. In the meantime, we really appreciate you listening to the podcast, all the comments, all the reviews, all the feedback. Please keep that coming. And we look forward to seeing you in a week's time. So Outrage and Optimism is a production of Global Optimism. It is produced by Clay Carnell. The team includes Pete Cutton Brock, Chloe Revel, Natasha Rivet Karnak, Marina Mancilla, Alejandra Vargas Morera, Callum Grieve, and Zoe Cholakantich. I'd also like to thank Nigel Topping and Michael Northrup. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and please do subscribe. We'll see you next week.